to do is every couple of years is offer a, a lecture related to the work that I'm doing now. And I offer it to the series just as, as part of my service to, to all of you, to the university. And um, it's a pleasure. It's a great pleasure to do that. I work in the fields of early Jewish apocrypha and pseudepigrapha. That's really the area in which I specialize. It is, uh, we'll define those terms in a second. Um, the, uh, these texts are, are of interest to many people because many of them are somehow related to the Bible or connected to the Bible, an expansion of the Bible, a rewriting of the Bible. And what I wanted to do today is look into the idea of this, I, this theme of pseudepigraphy, false writing, pseud, false, uh, epi, epigraph writing. Things that are allegedly uh, fa uh, falsely attributed to someone. My area of expertise is in the, on the text related to uh, Jeremiah's scribe Baruch, the Baruch ben Nuria. He was uh, the scribe who worked, according to the Bible, with Jeremiah. So I specialize in that literature associated with him. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not much of a life, but it's the one I have. <laughs> So it's, and it even gave birth to a book. And it even gave birth to a book. We may see that. Uh, so what about this idea of forgeries? Could there be forgeries, falsely written books, uh, or books attributed to somebody who actually didn't write them? The first five books are called the books of Moses. Moses. So we assume the author is Moses. Moses. And... Uh, we turn to Deuteronomy. Mostly where we get that is from the book of Deuteronomy, this passage. When Moses had finished writing down these laws from beginning to end in a book, he commanded the Levites, take this book of the Torah and put it in the Ark of the Covenant. Thus we have the Torah. Thank you very much. Right? And then we start reading. Scholarship on these books since the 19th century has, has pretty much concluded that they're not all written by the same person. The first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, were not written by one person. In fact, they were written over centuries, uh, spanning from as early as the 9th century, uh, some would even say the 10th century, uh, down to, uh, I would say, probably the 5th century. Some people would take it down all the way to the 2nd, but everybody's allowed to make mistakes. Uh, that's just way too late. So in other words, these books are attributed to Moses based on this verse, largely on this verse. And we know as scholars, actually they weren't written by him. They were written over several centuries by people living in different places at different times. So we know it's a compilation. Uh, it's just attributed to Moses, although that attribution has become in most traditional scholarship, a statement of authorship, which it is not. What about the Psalms? I can put Howard on the, on the spot again. Psalm 90, Howard. Okay, translated means? Uh, a song of Moses, man of God. Song of Moses, man of God. We have in the room Hebrew students. When you see uh, tefillah le Moshe, what do you what do you know? This prayer belongs to Moshe. Moses. That's an authorial statement, right? That this is a psalm written by Moses, and that's in verse one. So that's part of the biblical text. The biblical text is saying this is a psalm of Moses. Watch carefully. An English translation, a prayer, ascribed to Moses, the man of God. Verse 1, what happened there? What happened was, in verse 1 here, a psalm of Moses, man of God, is in verse 1. Here, it's part of a superscription. The editors of this English translation, this is a new Revised Standard translation, a very modern translation. 
They took that as a superscription. Look at this carefully. Not only is it not part of verse 1, what else is it? Ascribe to, not written by, not a psalm of. Ascribe to. What else? The man of God. That's, I, I, would write, I would write that in the other one. Look at the font. They even put it in a different font. Size and italics. What are the editors telling you here? It's not part of the psalm. It's a superscription added later. So in terms of authorship as an academic, what do I do? I just started it here, verse 1, right? Which is here, verse 2, right? Or the latter part of verse 1. So what happens? We have here a superscription that was added later that modern scholars can look at and say, oh, that's a superscription. It's, is that a statement of authorship that I can go at an academic conference and defend that Moses wrote this thing? No, I can tell you I cannot do that. It, uh, I can also tell you by, the, by the, uh, the grammatical structures in here, right? So what happens? We take that to be a later addition to the psalm. It's not a statement of authorship. It's a statement of traditional belief. This should, this seems like it should come from Moses. This is fittingly attributed to Moses. In other words, we're seeing a different idea about authorship in the Bible. Is it a fraud? Is it a forgery? It's, a, it's ascribed to him. It's ascribed to him. Here, it's part of the text. It's verse 1. Here, academics have gotten a hold of it and rearranged it. Right? Verse 1 is now just real short right? because we've taken that part out. Okay. Uh, how many Isaiahs in the book of Isaiah? When you read the book of Isaiah, the first thing you think of, oh, I'm reading a book written by an 8th century prophet by the name of Isaiah. Nice chap, I'm sure. Right? I'm reading the book. Uh, but what we've known for the last couple hundred years is that, in fact, there are at least three people involved in the production of this book. The first... 30, uh, first 39 chapters attributed to this 8th century Isaiah, this real prophet attributed to. That's the best we can say. It, this seems like it came from that period. Uh, chapters 40 through 55 we call Deutero-Isaiah or second. second Isaiah, right? And we ascribe it to the 6th century, an exilic context when when at the time Judeans were exiled, uh, many Judeans were exiled to Babylon. And finally, chapters 55 to 66, third Isaiah, which is probably written by someone after people returned from Babylonian exile. How do we do that? We just look at, we look at the text and you read it carefully. If in the first section there's statements about Jerusalem existing, and then in the third section, there's statements about people returning, the prophet predicting people returning from exile in Babylon. We know it was written after people returned from Babylon. I don't believe in predictive prophecy myself, right? If I did, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in Vegas, <laughs> right, uh, if I could predict the future. So what happens? This, by strictly humanist academic approach, when I see a statement that says, and you will return from Babylon and do this, I know it's written after they return from Babylon. Okay? So that's a uh, situation in the Hebrew Bible. Because I, I would imagine some people here might be interested in it. There's also evidence of this in the New Testament. Who wrote the Gospels, by the way? Lots of folks. Uh, lots of folks. Who are they ascribed to? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, all right, we're doing very well today. Now, now do we include the um, gospel according to Mary Magdalene? The oh, sure. Ooh, Thomas, we got all kinds of gospels running around. 
I've got a uh, Hebrew Bible, Old Testament Apocrypha here. I could do the same if I were bringing in the New Testament stuff. There's all kinds of stuff. But what happens? Those four canonical Gospels were not the only four Gospels, obviously. There are other ones that were early as well. And it says where in there that Matthew wrote Matthew? Oops. That Mark wrote Mark. Oops. That Luke wrote Luke. That John wrote John. Nowhere. Those are traditional ascriptions. We just ascribed, somebody ascribed them to there a long ways back because we have manuscript evidence where those titles are on already by the, by the fourth century, right? So we know that they was, these were early traditions, but they're not authorial statements, okay? They're gospels. We don't know who wrote them, right? So the four people that get chosen are because they were associated with Jesus or with Paul. Paul himself wrote several New Testament epistles or letters. Some, when we look at all of them, we realize, you know, it doesn't sound like the Paul we know from the other ones. The, the, the descriptions of the church and the complexity of church structure and authority and all that are different from what we have in these other Pauline texts. So we say, maybe this is somebody else. One case in 2 Thessalonians, Colossians, and Ephesians, we call them Deutero-Pauline epistles. I would explain that as people associated with Paul wrote these, attributed them to Paul. Poor Jerry. If you do that in my class, then we have a meeting with the dean of students. And it doesn't go well. I've only done that once in 26 years. Um, and that was unpleasant. But what happens, these are people who are associated with Paul who wrote epistles to these churches in the spirit of Paul and attributed it to Paul, their leader. They're close. The next set, these pastoral epistles. These are written, these are, they're, are, they're called the pastorals. They, they deal with church administration and structure. Uh, Timothy and Titus. These texts have such a bizarrely developed view of church uh, polity, of church structure, of the hierarchy in the church, that it doesn't sound at all like Paul. So we know these were written much later, not by Paul. They would, many would just say these are non-Pauline, and it's called the, the pastorals, right? They are attributed to Paul. They're associated with Paul. But as academics, we're pretty certain I would say completely certain that they're not Pauline. We'd say, if you turned it into me as a paper and you wrote Paul on there, I'd have to send it back and say, see me in the Dean of Students office, <laughs> right? What you've written here about deacons and presbyters and all that doesn't fit with what it says about Paul and these other ones we know are Pauline. We need to talk. Right? Some kind of forgery. Now, what is this word pseudepigraphy? I mentioned it earlier. Pseudepigraphy. False writing. False suit epigraph. Right? Writing. This term is a collection. The, the term pseudepigraphy is the process of falsely attributing a book to somebody who didn't write it. In other words, I write a book and I attribute it to Howard. I get the royalties, he gets the title. <laughs> royalties actually will come into play here in a second. So what happens? This is a, a process that we're uncomfortable with. As a professor, if you turn in a paper to me and you have put your name on it, and I actually have programs I can run to see if this is taken off the internet or plagiarized from somewhere else or sources are not identified, I can run that and find out fairly quickly. I only do that a couple times a semester when I really kind of have a key. I hit one, you know, one time, it was an interesting story. A person turned in a paper under, under his name. This is my paper. Okay, fine. And I'm reading this, I thought, well, this sounds really good. I don't think that guy's that smart. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, man, I've read this somewhere. I've read this somewhere. I walk over to my shelf in my study at home. And unfortunately for this chap, I got the same book right at home. <laughs> and I swear to God, I walked over there, pulled this thing off, turned to the section, 
And I, I, I didn't even have to flip, you know, a couple pages, and I was there. And I just say, oh, my, this is not good for him. Uh, and then off we went. So what happens? We don't like that idea. We don't like that. In the ancient world, this was very common, very common, writing something in somebody else's name. Pseudepigraphon or pseudepigrapha. Those are the books that are produced that way. If I'm writing this thing and I'm attributing it to Howard, then I'm doing pseudepigraphy. The book itself is a pseudepigraphon. And if I did several of them, they would be called pseudepigrapha. All right, so that's where those, those terms come from. And we're going to be referring to that throughout. Uh, this is the kind of work I do. Now, what could be the motives of these things? We don't understand it. We're uncomfortable with forgery. I, you know, have people, ex I had a person expelled because of forgery, right? And if it turns out that somebody's done this and I have to deal with it, it's unpleasant. We don't like it. We have, we have attorneys who will sue you if you do stuff like that, if you don't attribute their stuff to them uh, properly. There's a part of law that does that. So what are some of the things that pe why people do this? And it was common in the ancient world. I've already shown you plenty of examples. Right? It was common. And there's all kind of pseudo-Clementines, you know, pseudo-Aristotle. Uh, uh, there's all kinds of stuff out there. It, I mean, it's very popular. Okay? So why could one reason do this? Well, one is it gets an audience for your work. You know, you're just a schmo over here, but you want to attribute it to Donald Trump. Everybody knows him, attribute it to him. All, or Bill O'Reilly, for the life of me. How many people is that guy going to kill? Lincoln, Kennedy. Bill, uh, he's doing everybody, right? He's doing all these books. And somebody once asked me, well, you know, you're writing something on, uh, it was, I think I was talking about in the con context about Lincoln. Well, you know what uh, Bill O'Reilly said about Lincoln? I said, no, and I don't really care. <laughs> you know what he's talking about. He's a very smart guy. He probably has researchers working for him. But you're never going to cite a book like that in an academic context, right? So you attribute it to someone who will get it out there. Uh, another reason to do it is for financial reward. If you use a popular name, let's say I write a book, and I've always kind of wanted to do this and attribute it to Jesus. <laughs> He's got a lot of followers, right? And I, and, I, and I write it, and I write it in Greek, and I could, I could probably do the New Testament Greek fairly well. I could probably pull it off. I get close. There'd be, there'd be mistakes, I'll, I can guarantee you. But I'd work that, and then I'd make a translation. Then I'd go on Oprah, <laughs> get in a newspaper, CNN. You can make money at that. There's a financial incentive for doing this, sometimes. Another possibility is that you want to honor the author. And I think that's where a lot of this comes in. The, certainly the things on Paul, that's what's going on. They want to honor their teacher, Paul. Uh, I think in some of the Psalms, when they're attributing it to different people, that's part of that process. Finally, um, and this is where I've been criticized. I think people can have experiences and write, and they're convinced that they've actually become that person. And when they're right, they're writing in the spirit of that person. You know, if you want to call it spirit possession, or I don't know whatever kind of spooky terms you want to give it, uh, channeling. These kinds of things, I think, are possible. That they have an experience you know, they have a dream experience, some kind of, of special experience that they become that person. And when they write, they're writing what that person would, be, would want them to write, right? I guess the word is channeling that stuff, right? So those are possibilities. Now, these texts flourished. They flourished. And this, um, I mean, there are, there, there, I mean, these things go on and on and on and on. And, you know, they just were circulating around. Churches were gathering them. Clerics were studying them. Uh, even the rabbis knew of these things and cited them or alluded to them. 
But it wasn't until Fabricius in the uh, early part of the 18th century, who uh, I think around 1715 or so, probably put the date, 1713, um, collected them and put them in a book. Now, once you collect something and put covers on it, it then becomes a book. And then when you read it, you read, oh, here's the first part, here's the second part, here's the third part. Whereas originally, those were all just floating around. Right? They were all, it, was, it was collecting a bunch of newspaper articles, putting it together, and calling it a book. All these things were floating around. For the first time, if I could call it, he anthologizes it. And he creates an anthology. And then people start talking about the pseudepigrapha. That's the title of his book, right? The book of, of Old Testament pseudepigrapha, right? So what, hap what happens? This now becomes a collection, right? It becomes a collection. He uh, publishes this thing, and people are fascinated by it. It's, uh, as you can see, it's written in Latin. It's really fascinating stuff. I would have loved to have been uh, uh, lived in this period. I mean, except for some of the, I, I like modern life. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, what happens? These guys are communicating, these scholars are communicating back and forth in Latin, and only they could read it. It's, it's, talk about the Illuminati. Only they can read one another's work. And they're writing about these you know, weird texts in Latin back and forth, and you read their correspondence, it's just utterly fascinating, the life they led. These guys are all studying it, and then what happens? People figure out, well, we should have these in vernacular translation. So Couch is the first one, he creates a German translation of this thing. And it becomes wildly popular, wildly popular in Europe. The Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha of the Old Testament, right? And, and here he is. Uh, published uh, 1900, right around 1900, two volumes. And it's a volume of Apocrypha, I'll get to that in a second, and this wild collection of Pseudepigrapha. That remember before were just texts floating around. Once you put a cover on them, then they become a collection. And you say, oh, I'm going to study the, the pseudepigrapha. What is that? Right? No one would have known before because they were just floating around. Finally, it comes into English. Charles uh, at Cambridge uh, went through and um, uh, created a translation of all these texts that were in um, uh, Fabricius and in Couch and makes them available to English. Here's, the, here's one of the volumes. That's one, vo one of two volumes. That's how much stuff is in here. That's how popular this stuff was. He was, uh, that was the standard for many years until 1983 and 1985 when Charles was succeeded by Charles Worth. Again, one of two volumes. This one, much smaller print. <laughs> dozens upon dozens of texts. In each one of these editions that I'm showing you, the number, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. Let me go back this way. Each one of these editions gets larger and larger because they're including more and more texts. Right? They get bigger and bigger. Right? So you move from a couch to Charles to Charles Worth. Jim Charlesworth is still a professor at Princeton at Theological Seminary. Then, starting in 2013, we have another text, Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. The first volume is out. I'm waiting on the second volume. More texts, and they keep adding more, which tells you what? They're finding they have more stuff. They're starting to include a wider range of material. And all of a sudden, the old boundaries of these things are breaking down. Finally, out and look at the titles of these. Pseudepigrapha, 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 pseudepigrapha. We got tired of that name. Actually, the name is bad. It, Calling it falsely written is kind of accusing it at the outset. They're just texts. They're just texts. Now, outside the Bible, ancient Jewish writings related to scripture, a very anodyne title. 
right? Nothing accusatory, nothing pseudepigraphic in there, right? So it changed. This is now three volumes this size. <laughs> and I want to thank uh, Mark Elliott for carrying these over for me. <laughs> those things are heavy, okay? So uh, this book is 2013. That section, that three volume is complete. Now, where do we get these things? Where did this all start? Most Protestants will point to, ah, the books that we call Apocrypha, now remember, there are two collections. Apocrypha, that's one volume of this. Pseudepigrapha, another volume of this. Where did those come from? The books in the Apocrypha, that is that section I'll show you shortly, in Catholic Bibles, between the Old Testament and New Testament, that comes from the, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible. In other words, we have... Every day, I didn't bring it with me, but I showed a picture earlier, a Hebrew Bible. You can come, we can study Hebrew Bible, we'll sit around and read the Hebrew Bible, a lot of fun. Right? That's a closed canon. Right? All of a sudden, we're reading Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament. And the first thing you're taught, I know I was taught as a young man, oh, that's the Greek translation of the Bible, sometimes not so good, as if those people didn't know what they were doing. Sometimes not so good, and it includes books that they didn't know weren't in the Hebrew Bible. They didn't know what we know. Maybe they know more than we know, was my question. This actually was in my undergraduate thesis, my undergraduate honors thesis, it's where I started on this stuff. So what happens? The Septuagint is another version of the Bible. Forget the translation part. That it is. It's a translation of a Hebrew Bible that people had in front of them. And it was different from the Hebrew Bible we're used to. The Hebrew Bible, that's the basis of the Old Testament in English you read today. It's a different version. I told you I work in Baruch stuff. Because I work in Baruch stuff, I have to be familiar with the Jeremiah stuff. The book of Jeremiah in Hebrew and Greek vastly differs. Vastly. And if you really want... The true words of, of Jeremiah, you read the Greek version. Tell the rabbis that. <laughs> you know, the Hebrew I learned, I got to learn Greek. Yeah, I think that's the more, more uh, accurate edition. So this book, the Septuagint, is actually a version of the Bible that differs from the Hebrew one. It was translated from a different Hebrew tradition. The one we have in the Hebrew Bible and English Old Testament today. And then there's the one behind the Septuagint. At one time, these were competing. Who read the Greek version? Jews in Alexandria and other places that didn't know Hebrew. Their native language was, after Alexander's conquest, Greek. So they would read the Bible. They didn't turn to the Hebrew Bible. You'd hand a Hebrew, put a scroll in front of them, they'd go, they wouldn't know which end to start at, right? Because you, you read opposite. Okay? They wouldn't know. So what happens? They take their Greek, and they can go from there. They know the Bible in Greek. That's their Bible. And guess what that Bible has? Those extra books. For them, that's the Bible. Christians come along. What are they going to use? The Greek version. New Testament, you look at the New Testament, it's citing the Septuagint or uh, some versions of the Septuagint. So we know that's what they're using. And if they're using it, they're also reading those apocryphal books. That's part of their Bible. And what do we find the church fathers doing? Citing those apocryphal books. Right? In their commentaries, in their liturgies, all this stuff. So it's, very, it's a very productive thing. I gave you a handout. It'll have the list of those books. These are books, the Apocrypha, are the books found in that Septuagint, that Greek translation. Uh, and it has uh, several extra books, 15, depending on which version you use, 15 to 17 different books of the Apocrypha. Uh, when you look at manuscripts of the Bible, I look at manuscripts, you look at an early codex, 4th century codex of the Bible, that's the earliest book of the Bible we have. And you go through it, you go through Jeremiah in Greek, guess what you come to? The book of Baruch, right after it. That's where I'm going, on the book of Baruch. It's my work. 
So people who were reading that read Baruch as part of Jeremiah. These books were biblical. They're biblical books for these people, for these early Jews and Christians. Here's the list of them. You can see your list. Notice how this, and this is a photo from uh, 1611 version of the King James Bible. People will tell you the King James Bible, the Anglican Bible, does not have the Apocrypha. First edition did. And then what happened? It was dis there was a dispute over including those. Because who included those? The Catholic Church included them. This is a Protestant church. We don't do that. That's an us-them thing. Right? So the next version drops out. But here's the original, and you can see them. Right here. That's the first edition. Jeremiah. When we get to Jeremiah, here's a Greek version. Uh, this is, again, the, the Greek translation of it. This is one of the codex. This is Sinaiticus, 4th century uh, Hebrew, uh, Greek codex. Before we had the Dead Sea Scrolls, this was the earliest version of the Bible we had, and it was in Greek. Right? Uh, this contains those apocryphal books, and the book I'm interested in for today is the book of Baruch. It immediately follows Jeremiah or was part of it. Now, this is a fascinating thing. When Christian authors cite this book I'm about to talk about, the book of Baruch, they cite it not as Baruch until the 8th century. They cite it as, guess what? Jeremiah. So it's part of Jeremiah for them. It's part of their biblical Jeremiah. It's fascinating. When we think of canon, you know, uh, we think of canon as the book that several of you probably have Bibles uh, in your possession right now. That's a fixed text. I'm in a period where it's not so fixed. It's rather fluid. And I'm interested in the people who are using those different books. right? Because that's their Judaism. That's their Christianity. And they're using those books. So, Baruch. I've been associated with him for some time. And uh, that's a plug. So rush out. It's Cyber Monday, so you can. I actually will allow you to use your phones to purchase <laughs> copies. Right? Uh, this book, uh, the book I wrote, is about uh, Baruch ben Nuria, the scribe, Jeremiah's, Jeremiah's associate. He, in that book, basically what I trace is just the development of his, how people depict him throughout these various texts. Right? It's not a, it's a couple hundred pages, nothing, nothing major. And uh, I explain each text and what it's about. So if you're interested in that, that's there. And it's something I'm fascinated with. And I now have under contract to write a technical commentary on one of them, one of the texts in Greek. I'll show you some others in a second. It all builds off of Jeremiah 45, in my view. Here's Jeremiah 45 in Hebrew. The fact that I just said that tells you what's coming up next. A different version of it in Greek. Okay. In other words, we can see that the Bible isn't as fixed as we thought it was. The word of the prophet Jeremiah spoke to Baruch and Nuria. Thus says the Lord God of Israel to you, O Baruch. You said, Woe is me, the Lord has added sorry to, sorrow to my pain. <coughs> I am weary with my groanings and have no rest. Thus says the Lord, I'm going to break down what I have built, pluck up what I have planted, namely the whole land. What's he talking about? The destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. All right? In 586. And you, do you seek great things for yourself? He's talking to Baruch. Seek them not, for I am bringing disaster upon all flesh. Baruch, don't, don't sink, seek, dolot, great things. But I will give you your life as prize of war in every place to which you go. I used to translate this phrase, prize of war, as booty. It doesn't mean the same things to the young kids today. <laughs> right? Uh, so the students know what booty means. My definition, many generations here, that means the prize of war, what you get when you capture somebody. And it may include booty, too. I don't know. Um, but the prize of war, those things you get when you conquer someone. Here is a statement in chapter 45 of Hebrew Jeremiah. From God, not to Jeremiah, but to Baruch. Baruch. 
Jeremiah is now the mouthpiece of God for Baruch. This is in chapter 45. There are 52 chapters. So this is buried somewhat in Hebrew, Jeremiah, which tells you the next line. Has it moved to chapter 52? This same text in Greek Jeremiah comes at the end. So in Greek Jeremiah, the very last person addressed by God is not Jeremiah, but Baruch. And then what book follows this? Baruch in the Greek text. So what was happening? I think in the Greek tradition, they were making Baruch out to be a new prophet, succeeding Jeremiah. This is my argument. Succeeding Jeremiah. Do you get that from the Hebrew Bible? No. Why? Because they bury this stuff about Jeruk seven chapters earlier. It's not at the end. It's still important, to be honest. There are oracles against the nations that come in. Right? But what happens is, in Greek Jeremiah, in the white here, that's what happens at the end of the book. And it sets us up for people asking the questions, well then, what's going to happen with Baruch? And guess what happened? Pseudepigraphy. People said, you know, I got to finish Baruch's story. I got an idea. And they started writing this stuff. So here are Baruch's writings. Jeremiah, uh, some would claim, I don't accept this, uh, but I understand it. I think it makes sense. I just don't accept it. Uh, that Jeremiah, that Baruch wrote the book of Jeremiah. Why? Because in part, in a couple chapters in there, Baruch is described as copying Jeremiah, down Jeremiah's words. Twice. One time the king destroyed him, and then he rewrote the scroll. He probably told Jeremiah, don't do that again. I don't want to have to rewrite this again. <laughs> right? So, because he gave it to the king, and the king destroyed it. Right? Cut it up with his pen knife and put it in the flames. The book of Baruch that I'm going to look at now, a Syriac <clears throat> apocalypse of Baruch, we call two Baruch, and a Greek apocalypse of Baruch, three Baruch. Those are the major ones. There are some other small traditions associated with Baruch. Now, so this book has really four sections. A narrative introduction that sets it into Babylonian exile and the destruction of Jerusalem. A penitential prayer in which Baruch says, oh, I, I'm sorry for our sins. God, forgive us. Restore us to our land. All really nice stuff for the belief that is a biblical belief that if you sin, God's going to get you. This idea, God got us, therefore we must have sin. sin therefore we need to pray for forgiveness. Repent and pray for forgiveness. Well, that's, why that, that's that prayer. Then there's the section of wisdom. This, is, this makes Baruch look like Solomon. Right? In the book of Proverbs. Right? He's a very wise man, sage man, the, the, distributing wisdom to the people. Okay? And it ends with a letter of cons uh, consolation that he writes to the exiles in Babylon, like Jeremiah did. In other words, he's someone who's concerned for the people that they have God's word. It's fascinating uh, material attributed to him. Now, how did this thing come together? How did somebody forge this book? Notice, how many sections? Four separate sections. I will tell you right now, the only place where Baruch's name is mentioned, the first. Only in the first. It only appears there once. There's another occurrence, but it's a, it's a textually uh, a suspect context, right? I would claim that each of those four sections existed as separate pseudepigrapha. They were circulating on their own in different communities. One a prayer, one a book of wisdom, not associated with Baruch at all because it doesn't mention his name. And then this, this, this letter of consolation sent to exiles who are living and, 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 and encouraging them to live a righteous life. Those four texts were not gathered into a book of pseudepigrapha. They just floated around. They just floated around. Then what I would say, someone in the second or first century took those and brought them together. What did that person want to do? I think 
enhance or complete the story of Baruch, to complete or enhance it. Because what does it say about him in Greek? He's, God's on his side. Well, there must be more to the story. God wouldn't let it drop. It's not like the end of a season series on TV. You have to come back to see who killed JR. Sorry, some of you guys won't understand that one, but a lot of people here did. <laughs> right? So what happens? That's, they have to complete the story. How did he do it? Here's how I think he did it. Here's how, we, here's how you forge something. The prayer. What does it show? That the author's pious. He prays and gives a very heartfelt, penitential prayer. It makes the author of that look very pious. No mention of Baruch. The wisdom section. This shows the author is really smart. It's not just smart. It's wisdom that comes from life experience. It's true wisdom. This author, whoever wrote this, because nobody's mentioned, is wise. The next section, the letter of consolation, it shows this person is concerned for his community and its well-being. He's a communal leader in that section. I've got these texts. It's the end of the semester. I'm pressed for time. Rather than write my own, here's an anonymous text that nobody's really doing much with. Here's another one. Ooh, look at this letter. That's nice, too. I'll write an introduction in which I mention Baruch and then tie them all together. I know that they're separate because in the grammatical structures, I can tell they're different, too. I know uh, in this, this section here, uh, the first chapter through uh, chapter 3, verse 8, was probably written originally in Hebrew. I can tell by the Greek. It's translation Greek. So I know that was written in Hebrew, right? But it was eventually translated into Greek and created this text. Out of whole cloth, we got a story about Baruch that had nothing to do with him. But what does it show? It shows, I think, this person's desire to honor him. Why did people write letters, ascribe them to Paul? To honor him, to carry on his tradition. Why did they do uh, the same with Moses? David, Aristotle for that matter, to carry on that tradition, because he would have thought that kind of stuff. So there are his writings again. The book of Jeremiah, the book of Baruch, writing a commentary on that. I've been asked to do one on this one, too. I like working in Syriac. I, that's a thing I, again, it's not much of a life, but it's the one I have. Okay? Uh, so that's a massive tax. That would be a 15-year project. Uh, who knows, who knows. So there's a lot, a lot to be said. Baruch was very popular for this kind of writing. In each one of these develop out of different contexts. This is apocalyptic Baruch. This is apocalypse showing history. This is an apocalypse showing a tour of heaven. That Baruch, not only was he a wise sage and pious, he was so wise and pious, because this is the last of them, God allowed him to ascend to heaven and come back and tell about it. That's great stuff. And if you've ever been to heaven, there's one thing you've got that nobody else has. Major cred. <laughs> right? Major cred. Because you've been in God's presence, and it's not like you had visions or heard voices. God spoke to you directly while you were there. That's how you create a biblical book. Forgeries. Are there, I, you know, the forgery, obviously, that word in the title, is, is, is to stir attention. Are they forgeries? Yeah, if you want to call them that. But they're not, they're, these are not wicked attempts. They're not de defrauding anybody. They're attempts, I think, to, to carry on that person's tradition and to enhance it. Maybe there, in some cases, there was some financial benefit. And we can't blame them for that, right? Um, as a capitalist, I'll let, the, I'll let him go on that one. Right? So what happens? In the Bible, there are these kinds of texts outside the Bible. One of the things that fascinates me is, is how these things brought together. I bought a book here. This is a Septuagint, right? a Greek translation. Greek translation. 
What's unique about this book from your side? Look at the paper. Part of it is yellow. This is the Septuagint put out by the British and Foreign Bible Society, <coughs> an Anglican press, right? If you look carefully, you'll see part of it, the last part, has yellowed paper. That has it, and the other side has it yellowed. The side that has it yellowed is the what you would understand as the Hebrew Bible Old Testament. Guess what the yellowed part is? The Apocrypha. They used cheaper paper. <laughs> That's the only reason I bought this, right? It's, it's, I looked at it, I pulled it off the shelf, and I what the world? And then I looked at it, and I saw right where the page ends, and couldn't believe it. And I bought it for that reason. I was in London somewhere, or Oxford or somewhere, and I bought it. And I bought it, and I thought, you know, it's an apocrypha, a Greek with English. It's not something I'm going to need, but I bought it just for that, because it shows the bias against those books. Are they, is it pseudographic, right? Is it bad writing? Is it apocrypha, means, means hidden or secret? No. They're books that entertain Jews and Christians for centuries. And it's okay for us to enjoy them today. Thank you very much.